the fire, considered one of the more wild elements of our world. Pure, unbridled energy, the passion of nature when instigated by an unruly and sometimes even unnatural spark. It has many meanings throughout history and its many cultures therein. Chaos and passion, enlightenment and power, purity and destruction. Fire has, in a way, been one of the older friends to humanity. For the varied ages of smiths, fire has been the invaluable base to make metal form more agreeable. Many a scholar would ponder and muse over their text in the darkness of night, well lit and warmed by the revealing glow of candlelight. And for a time, longer than we may care to admit, both men and women have been burned alike within the fire a testament to the purifying flames for those wicked enough to pay the ultimate price. We have a right to fear fire, for it takes and burns. Things have a way of vanishing in the fire, such as whole forest and even homes. Is it not also said that in women and men, deep down there's a burning flame of ambition, uncontrollable, forever wanting, and, if neglected, undeniable? The truth of the matter, however, is that I'm not here to talk of the destructive side of fire. No. For, while the dancing of the flame may not be so dominable by man, nor fully understood, it is not always so hot and fierce, but sometimes warm and gentle, perhaps transformative even. But please, no, I'm not here to sell you on a religion, or to instill a sense that your own beliefs are lesser or wrong. I am not also here to read to you an entire book, but rather to give you a brief taste of the writing, as well as the personality of the writer involved. You do not have to believe or agree with what is spoken here, but please know that it is only my wishes to share with you some curiosity. That curiosity is brought to you today by Marion Woodman's and Eleanor Dixon's Dancing in the Flames, The Dark Goddess and the Transformation of Consciousness. perfect place to start by the warm crackle of a fire. So, what then is this book all about? In the words of Joan Halifax, this powerful book about the Dark Goddess is a rich and intimate exploration that brings together history, mythology, psychology, and religion. The authors have written a seed text that is wise, vigorous, and revelatory, and I see nothing more relevant than beginning with an introduction. Who is the goddess? Who is she who sometimes replaces he in our prayers? Is goddess any different from God in her inner pantheon, or have we merely changed the nouns and pronouns? What are the attributes of the goddess? Who is she as mother, virgin, crone? How does she relate to the masculine? If we throw ourselves into the flames of desire and then dance with her in the refining fire, how will our everyday lives be changed? If we really do believe she holds the whole world in the palms of her love, how do we live with that sacramental truth at her center? This book explores these questions concerning the unknown feminine figure who is appearing in the dreams of so many contemporary men and women. Many people dismiss dreams as speculative and anecdotal. However, for those of us who have lived in close touch with our dreams all our lives, 
They offer truth far beyond facts. They bring new perspectives and new understandings to our experience. Fred Allen Wolf, a theoretical physicist, claims that dreaming is vital to our survival as a species and a necessary learning laboratory, wherein the self and the universe evolve. In brief, matter evolves through dreams. This unknown figure, whom so many people encounter in their sleep, speaks to the psyche and to the very cells of the body. She seems to push through from the very depths of the collective unconscious, like a universal force that speaks individually and culturally. Hopefully, this book will add to the pool of consciousness that is expanding around her. Although she takes many different forms, this goddess, sometimes a Black Madonna or an Asian or Indian Madonna, always carries authority. She guides and advises and acts with absolute clarity, often with a startling sense of humor that delights in play. These moments in dreams or active imagination are filled with her compassion for our human situation. She is blunt, neither indulgent nor sentimental. She demands embodiment. Living in the creative intercourse between chaos and order, she calls us to enter into the dance of creation, her love in her living body. She speaks to men as clearly as to women. Both genders need a well-differentiated masculine and a well-differentiated feminine. The power structures of patriarchy have profoundly wounded both, making mature relationships almost impossible without hard psychic work. As a culture, we are presently stuck in the parental complexes. Many women have worked for years trying to find their own identity, freed from the mother and father complexes. Men, too, are working to find their own feeling values, values that are not dependent on pleasing or hating mother and father and all they represent. The archetype of the Black Madonna or Lilith or Mary Magdalene may be a way to freedom for both. In writing this book, the authors have been very aware of the pitfalls of using the terms masculine and feminine. While these words are not synonymous with male and female, they unquestionably carry connotations that are so ingrained in our psyches that we consciously and unconsciously react to them with ancient gender prejudices. It would be a great relief to forget the words, but the fact remains that the balance of energies in the dream cannot be understood without a recognition of the interplay between the male and female figures. The dream images are rooted in the instincts. This interplay enacts the balance or lack of balance between the two complementary energies that are continually relating to each other within us and without, continually struggling to compensate for the one-sided world of consciousness. The Chinese yang and yin represent the two energies as two fish in a circle, each containing part of the other. The Hindus represent them as Shiva and Shakti, the universal lovers, out of whose divine embrace everything is born. And in the Bible, the new paradigm is imaged as a new Jerusalem gradually taking shape throughout both the Old and New Testaments. In the final book, the New Jerusalem descends as a bride to meet the bridegroom in the divine marriage. Part of the resistance to the words masculine and feminine lies in our inability to accept that each of us contains both masculine and feminine energy, and that both energies are divine. We pay lip service to the concept consciously, but if we listen to ourselves, we hear the archaic, gendered, pigeonholed thinking plop out of our mouths like an unexpected toad. For example, some men and women who accept the goddess as equal to the god and proclaim her divinity and matter can still become angry if they hear femininity relates to earth. At some unconscious level, they continue to relate femininity to earth, snake, satan, dark, evil. All these words that keep femininity in a subordinate position, or even worse, a diabolical one. If we expand our consciousness a bit, we begin to see that our attitude to the earth, to nature, and to our own bodies is radically shifting. 
in the dire consequences arising from the well-documented abuse of Earth, nature, and our bodies, we begin to see that they will no longer tolerate the tyranny of our control. They will no longer submit to the slavery to which we try to subject them. The goddess is the life force in matter. She has laws that have now to be learned and obeyed. Her indwelling presence is the sacred energy, energy on which our egos have no legitimate claim. Confronted with this reality, a reality that is a confrontation with our own threatened survival, we realize that like Earth, nature, our bodies, we too are the vessels of an energy far greater than anything that tries to contain it. We realize that we, like the rest of nature, are participating members in the vast community of life whose sacredness we must embrace if we are to survive. If we are to ever arrive at this expanded consciousness, we will have to surrender our ego desires to the wisdom of the self. Masculine and feminine will have to learn to cherish each other. Many times throughout the book, we have chosen to use the word transcendence referring to the masculine spirit, and immanence, referring to the indwelling feminine. Neither of us is a theologian, but both of us can believe in the unknowable mystery, sometimes called God, and we can see that mystery manifesting its radiance through every living form and every moment. Transcendence uniting with immanence. If you go into your garden, you may feel yourself present in the divine embrace right there in the presence of a golden sunflower, with a mandala for its center, the imminence of the transcendent in the flower. If not here, where? Each has to be separated out from the other before the magnetic pull of the opposites brings them together. While we are clarifying words, we need also to note that patriarchy and masculinity are not synonymous. Female patriarchs can be just as domineering as males. Like their male counterparts, they live in a patriarchal ethos that operates through control over others, over themselves, over nature. We need to recognize also that many men have a more finely honed femininity than many women. We all are the children of patriarchy, and therefore, we all have to take responsibility for a killer power shadow that would massacre the feminine and the masculine in whatever form they manifest. This book is not a defense of the feminine at the expense of the masculine. The one without the other leads to suicide or tyranny. The historical data concerning the relationship of patriarchy to the feminine in Western culture has been well documented in other studies. Psychological implications of a few of the historical events of the past nine centuries have been included in Chapter 1 in order to bring some added dimensions to the Black Madonna that lies buried in our depths. Psyche does not work on a basis of causality as history does. It does not respect temporal cause and effect patterns of everyday life. Sometimes, historical facts illustrate psychological phenomena. Well, my friends, I do believe we have reached that time again where I'll call it here for now, and allow both of us to reflect on the words that have been shared so far. If any of this has provided you curiosity or provoked further interest, please be certain to read the description below for a link to the authors and their book, as well credits to assets used in the short film. Thanks for sharing this time with me, and I hope to see you very, very soon again.